Greetings and welcome back to all of my truth seekers out there. Welcome to the unveiling where we like to pull the curtain back and expose the truth on a lot of different topics that are plaguing not only the black community, but our society as a whole. Okay, so before we get into this, let's go ahead and be sure to like and share this video as well as subscribe so we can keep putting content like this out there because it's time to expose the truth. Okay, so without further ado, let's go ahead and pull the curtain back. Feminism because rich white women need to feel oppressed too. Now, I don't think I could have found a more perfect meme for this video other than this one because that's exactly what feminism is. This whole fight for equality, women's rights, all this and that. In my opinion, my humble opinion, is nothing more than um, a entitlement movement it's a it's an entitlement movement and even to this day in 2022 you can see a lot of the talking points within this movement and how it's not really about equality but more about superiority over men okay and I know that you know some people that might be a stretch but I hope you can sit back for a few minutes and just take in this quick history lesson so you can really learn the truth about where this idea of men and women being equal and this whole fight for uh, women's equality and, and their suffrage, where this idea really all came from. All right. So sit back, relax, and I hope you're ready for a lesson. So a lot of time when we talk about the feminist movement or women's rights or women equality, we only like to go back to the 50s and the 60s. And sometimes we'll go back to the 20s when we're talking about the 19th Amendment and the right to vote. But contrary to popular belief or knowledge, this movement actually started 100 years prior. So in like the 1800s and specifically in the 1840s. Now, that's important to note because it's, it's sad that so many of us and specifically um, black women and other minorities are indoctrinated with this Western idea of equality and feminism and women's rights because this was a fight that was fought for white women by white women. Now, before we get off into this, I just want you to think about this. Back in that time, of course, everybody was contributing to building this country. Now, specifically black people, we did build this country, black men and black women. And as we know, the white men were usually the slave owners. OK. With that being said, what exactly or in what ways did white women contribute to the foundation and modernization of this country? Okay. I want you to just think about that while I'm going through this because when they say that they were oppressed, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton is the face or the founder of the women's rights movement, the women's suffrage thing. Um, if you Google who invented feminism, you will find her. And I'm going to explain to y'all how this woman's lack of gratefulness I guess for her situation and her unaddressed trauma how it kind of stemmed and created this whole movement of entitlement so just real briefly Elizabeth Stanton came from a pretty well-to-do family her father was a politician her he was a lawyer her family enslaved black people her mother came from a family that enslaved black people so she was pretty well-to-do and pretty well off now Elizabeth had 11 it was 11 total sip total children that her parents had but I believe it was most of the all, or all of the boys had died before the age of 20 and so this kind of devastated her father of course you know because at that time he probably looking for somebody else to keep you know keep this slave stuff going and she one day was told by her dad something to the effect of you know he wished she was a boy or something like that so she internalized that and I guess went on a mission to try to prove that women and men could be equal or, you know, try to, to gain the validation and approval of her father, who was clearly just in grief and devastated because all his sons is gone and he can't keep carrying on his slave stuff. OK, so that's kind of a little bit of a background on her. And so in 1840, she uh, met someone and he was an abolitionist and against the wishes of her parents, she married this man anyway. 
Now keep that in mind because I just told y'all what type of family she came from. So for her to marry this man, it was kind of like, whoa. So in 1840, she married this man against her parents' wishes, and then they traveled to London for their honeymoon. Now in London, they were having the World Anti-Slavery Convention that was put um, together by some New York abolitionists. And like I said, her husband was an abolitionist, so he wanted to attend this event. She probably was just along for the ride, you know what I'm saying? But keep in mind, they had just got married. So she probably didn't know too much about him or what type of work he was actually into. So they go to this convention, and because it's the way of the time, she's not able to sit, you know, in the same section, or she can't, you know, cast any votes, and she can't really speak at this convention either. So she instead kind of pitches a fit and gets upset that they wouldn't let her in because she's a woman, all right? And she wasn't the only woman um, that was there that this happened to. There was another woman that she met by the name of Lucretia Mott. Um, and this, this woman was there too. And I guess the same thing happened with her. But the difference in their reaction, um, Lucretia Mott actually was an abolitionist, her and her husband. And so I think that she would have wanted to attend this and would have been fine with whatever parameters they put. But it's my belief that Elizabeth Caddy Stanton kind of pulled the, okay, well, we women, so we got to stick together card on her and kind of, you know, maybe guilted her to stay with her or, you know, whatever. So, yeah. And um, unbeknownst to these ladies or the, you know, the future, eight years later, they will be getting back together to arrange a women rights movement that kind of mirrored this event that was in London in 1840. Eight years later, July 9th, 1848, Mrs. Jane Hunt, the lady that you see in the bottom right hand corner, she hosted a tea party at her home. And this is something that she kind of always did. And with the exception of Elizabeth, all of these women were Quakers. So they will often get together, have tea, talk about, you know, the things that other Quakers probably weren't talking about um, and specifically trying to abolish slavery. And they invited Elizabeth to this um, tea party. And I'm probably sure it's because she and Mrs. Mott had met eight years earlier at the other convention. So these ladies got together and, you know, they discussed the things that they usually discuss. But with this new person, Mrs. Elizabeth, She's on the scene and she is just coming straight negative Nancy on him. All right. So remember how I said that in 1840, she married uh, Mr. Stanton against the wishes of her parents. And it's probably because, you know, she came from a family who probably um, encouraged uh, slavery, not really trying to abolish it. So when she came to this, to this tea party it's almost like she was like a cancer to the tea party she came you know talking about how miserable she was she was tired of taking care of her sick husband she was upset because she had moved to Seneca Falls just all of this complaining complaining but remember she did marry this man against the wishes of her parents so now it's like okay entitlement resentful and by the time these ladies broke away from a uh, tea party that night, they had put together basically a whole full, play, full fledged plan to have a, a, a convention to address equality of women and the rights of women and being able to have the same rights as men. Okay. Remember, Elizabeth is the one that had the political connections and the resources. I'm not saying that these other ladies didn't, but Elizabeth specifically, she was the one who had the motivation and the resources to be able to get this stuff moving forward. So after the ladies got active at the tea party, they were able to put together this convention, put flyers up, make people aware, and round up 300 plus men and women within 10 days, y'all. Okay, I told y'all that last convention, the World Anti-Slavery Convention, was an influence 
I, I believe to this women's rights convention, but dang, they it took them a year of planning for that. It took these women 10 days. So if that's not privilege, I mean, I don't know who else was making stuff happen that quick. But anyways, I digress. At this convention, the purpose was to basically discuss the grievances of women of that time and, you know, how much they were going through and all of their sentiments and feelings that they had uh, basically organized um, in that 10 day span from that tea party up until the, the convention. They were able to put together a document that was called the Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions. And I believe... I believe that, again, it was Mrs. Caddy Stanton and her access that allowed these women to have a document put together that mirrored the Declaration of Independence. Okay. These women were going through so much, supposedly, that they had to put together a, a document that was similar to the Declaration of Independence. Nah, I don't know, call it a coincidence, but... uh. I don't know. I'm calling it entitlement. So anyways, the fact that they were able to put together this declaration of sentiments and resolutions in such short time was crazy. Absolutely insane. And it's actually weird to me how, you know, they're saying that they want to be equal to men and this and that. But yet it was men who helped them organize and put this whole thing together. So when we say that feminism only exists in Western society and it only exists because men enabled it to exist, it's not really a stretch. So as you can see here, this was basically like the roll call and um, all of the signatures of the men and women who were in agreements with this Declaration of Sentiments that was presented at this conference. And most of these people on here um, are women, but they're it should be noted that there were some uh, people, some black people in attendance at this event as well. One of them being Frederick Douglass, who was one of the men who signed this. So as you can see here, the Declaration of Sentiments um, was very drawn out. Like I said, it mirrored the Declaration of Independence. And I'll go ahead and leave a link to this in the description so you can um, take a look and read it word for word yourself. But this contained all 12 of their uh, resolutions and things that they wanted to make happen. But the main things that they focused on were the right to be able to own property and keep their wages. And in 19, or I'm sorry, in 1848, we all know what was property. Okay, so let's not ever get it twisted about whose fight this was. They wanted the rights to own property. They wanted to be able to have the rights to a divorce. I can't help but to think that that was some doing of Mrs. Uh, Stanton because, again, she had all these complaints and woes about her husband and his sickness and all of that. So they wanted a rights to divorce. They wanted to be able to have access to education. And they also wanted to have the right to vote. Those were the kind of the four main things that these women were trying to get access to. And by the end of this convention, they had got 11 out of 12 of their resolutions. So they had got basically everything they wanted except the right to vote. And that didn't come until 1920. But keep in mind, this is 1848. And between 1848 and 1920, as a result of this conference going successfully, they, white women in particular, were able to make a lot of stuff happen, all right, for themselves. And it wasn't until later, you know, Susan B. Anthony would come in, her and Elizabeth Caddy Stanton will work together to create or to collect signatures to um, get the 13th Amendment passed. But again, let's not ever get it twisted. Elizabeth Cat Caddy Stanton, in my opinion, was in this thing for her own personal gain. She really didn't have a care to, uh, I'm not going to say she didn't have a care. She didn't have a genuine care or interest in abolishing slavery because, again, the family she came from benefited from slavery. They, they made a living probably off of slavery. 
So, yeah, I think it's kind of crazy that these women were able to get so much done in such short period of time. So similar to the women of the Seneca Falls Tea Party, I was able to jam pack a lot of information in a short period of time in this video. So I hope it was able, you guys are able to keep up with me. I hope this all makes sense. I will put the links to all of my research in the description box so you guys can, you know, go more in depth and find out a little more about it if you'd like. Um, but I hope that this makes sense. Um, again, wrapping this up with the same meme that I brought it in with. Because rich white women need to feel oppressed too. And I hope this point is a little more clear and, and makes more sense to you now that you've watched this video. So thank you guys again for rocking with me. All of my truth seekers out there, if you are ready to unveil and pull the curtain back on another topic, please be sure to like this video, share it with somebody you know, and be sure to subscribe to this channel. And comment below. Let me know what you think about this. Did I get it wrong? Did I miss something? Let me know what you guys think, and I will catch you guys on the next one. Peace out.